Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today for the Tread with Africa Summit. As I introduced myself earlier in the morning, my name is Michael Mujisha. Normally that means blessing, so just know you're blessed. <laughs> and uh, we have spoken about the African free, uh, the African continent or free trade area. I always say free before continental because there is an F and <laughs> I get it confused a lot of times. But 40, uh, 55 countries with north of a billion uh, people are in the market to deal with. What are the challenges that come with this, but also what opportunities does it present? Today, on the panel, I'll be speaking to uh, Jeff Jean Bertrand Azabmo. He's the regional trade advisor for the African Union. And Amara Enya, I hope that's how they read the name. And uh, she is the public she is a public policy expert. For all your questions regarding that, she is your girl. And Toin Umesiri, who is our host today, our lovely host, and also the CEO of Nazaru, soon launching a skincare line. We are going to look at some of the opportunities that the AFCFTA presents to African business men and women, but also to the world. There's a reason we did this in, in, today here and not in Africa, because we want to expand. And Africa is very wide open to all of you to share what we have back at home. Without further ado, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, take this on. I just did a little bit of an, uh, of an introduction, but they will tell us more about themselves and what they do and how that could be of impact to your business. Gentlemen, take it away. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, facilitator, and very good morning to you all. Uh, Jean Bertrand Zapmo is my name, and uh, I'm a regional trade uh, policy advisor uh, in the office of uh, Commissioner uh, Muchanga. And um, I've got uh, experience uh, in trade policy uh, formulation, negotiations, and implementation in the Asia Pacific and uh, in Africa. So what I'm currently doing, which will actually contribute to uh, making the CFTA possible, is to look at uh, something Commissioner spoke about earlier, which is very important, that is trade information. So basically, I'm coordinating the uh, implementation of the African Trade uh, Observatory. And I'm also working on uh, the um, uh, digital trade and digital economy uh, strategy. This is also very important because we basically, in um, uh, the digital era, we're living in uh, a knowledge economy. So it's important that as we continue talking about um, uh, the analog trade, that we also think about you know, what the digital trade could actually bring to, to the CFTA. And of course, uh, one of the, uh, the last thing I do you know, is um, regarding stakeholder engagement. Uh, stakeholder engagement is very important. Um, I think earlier there was commissioner spoke about how do we uh, ensure that the other stakeholders participate in the process. You know, whether it's um, the negotiation process, whether it's the implementation process, there has to be a strategy, you know, so as to ensure that um, trade policy formulation, development, and implementation is inclusive because that's the only way you will be able to get win-win uh, outcomes at the end of the day, you know, by making sure that all the stakeholders are actively involved and uh, that their views are reflected in whatever policies you come up with. So that's basically what uh, I do. I, I know I also work with, um, I mean, coordinate the work we do with Afrik Zimbang on the Intra-African Trade Fair, uh, but mainly those are the kind of uh, support that I provide at the uh, African Commission. And thank you, Tohin, for putting this together and uh, inviting us. Thank you. All right, Amara. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Amara Enya, and I work in public policy. I'm based here uh, in Chicago. Um, I've worked at the top levels of government, so I worked in the mayor's office. I also recently ran for mayor of the city of Chicago uh, on a platform that really centers the voices and the needs of people and public policy that actually emanates from the bottom up, public policy that works for people. So my background in, in public policy has really spanned across subject areas, economic development uh, being one of the key areas, education, housing security, uh, food security, pretty much across the board. And the idea is that the best way to affect people's lives is through policy. It determines everything that we're able to do. And so the work has expanded. I've worked with legislators drafting policy at the local and national level, uh, working with lawmakers. I also manage the Chamber of Commerce. So I work specifically with businesses, uh, both startups. I was affiliated with an incubator where we actually work with startup businesses, but also existing businesses that are looking to scale up from small to medium size to large, and especially how we connect them to government, which is one of the best ways that businesses can get a foot in the door and be able to grow. A lot of my interest now is in uh, doing capacity building, and as it relates to the free trade area, someone who has always sort of had an international lens because of my background, uh, and seeing the connection between global and local, Looking at the free trade area at two levels, the macro level meaning the trade that's happening between countries, but also the infrastructure within countries to ensure that it can be implemented with fidelity and so that it works and it is optimal. Um, that's something that is a heavy lift that the African Union is undertaking. Um, also as in the diaspora, our role to make sure that people are aware, particularly uh, Africans in the diaspora, African Americans, folks in the Caribbean, folks in the UK, that they actually are aware of what is happening on the continent because it is part of their birthright to take part in this new era of what's happening on the continent. Mm -hmm. And so for that, there's a lot of education that needs to be done uh, that I'm uniquely interested in, a lot of capacity building in the diaspora to connect them to the continent, and a lot of collaboration. So I'm really excited about uh, this phase of the work. And thank you for it. Thank you, Toyin, for uh, the invitation. Thank you to the commissioner, to everyone that's here uh, for, for this kind of gathering. Yes. All right, uh, Toyin. Yes, um, I'm Mike, though. Um, I kind of inserted myself into this um, panel because there are two sides to my work. There's the public side and there's the private side. The public side is everything you can see out there when you Google my name or our company. But on the private side, we're actually running transactions. So on the business commercial side. In fact, that was my goal in terms of transaction supply chain. That's the background I'm coming from. But what I found was that when it comes to conversation on trade with Africa and moving products and goods and services, um, if you're not engaged in the dialogue, if you're not at the table, and if you're not having the conversation with the right stakeholders, your work is hindered, right? So this platform was created. I had an ulterior motive to say, if I want to move products in and out, flow it through the chain, and there are barriers, who do I call? Hmm, now I know. So this platform was kind of, it came as a, my gift kind of to say, we need to have this conversation. We all want the same thing. We want the Continental Free Trade Agreement to work. But if people are behind the scenes, in closed room, signing deals, and keeping it secret, we're not going to benefit. Because the people that would actually benefit this, they are at the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of investors that are on the ground. But there are also people at the middle. And then there are people at the top. One of the things I want us to look closely at is the structure of the Afro champions. Are they the people at the top, the middle, or the bottom? We need to have a mix. Otherwise, we're going to miss out on the middle class. We're going to miss out on small, medium-sized businesses. And what we found in the United States is actually that's the, that's the people, the group that actually moves the economy. It's easier to create more jobs, bottom and middle, than at the top. You could have the very top companies, the number one, number two, number three, at the table, how many jobs are they going to create for you in a year? So for me, while we want to be a part of Afro Champions, I say we want to take a close look at the mix 
what type of companies are engaged in that? Because if it's only the top, mm -hmm. who is taking care of the middle class and the bottom? That's something I, I hopefully I'm contributing. So for me, it's this is a platform that is public, but on the private side, I want products. Um, I also want to propose for us to isolate certain products, certain regions, and for your observatory to run those products through the chain and be on call. If anything arises in the supply chain, be on call to say, this is the direct line. If you have an issue, we're going to break down barriers. So for us, that's why we also want stakeholders in the room when we talk like this to say, as a, as a business person, if I send um, a container, right, or if I send a truckload, when I get to that border, I'm there. The policy leaders are not there with me. Or my driver is there. The CEO is not there with me. The practicalities of this is what I'm, from a business standpoint, I want to see, mm -hmm. is what number do I call? Because I've also seen something with the Agua, for example. It's existed for 18, now going on 19 years. I just told people the pouches transacted with Agua, but it took me educating the border patrol US officials. I went to their table to, their, to, to do it, and they said, they've never heard of Agua before. Right. Because it was a political conversation in DC. So, yes, sir. So basically, I said, I have time. This is my job. Here's the website. I'll feed you information. Take the time. It took them two weeks. They will send me the information. They'll put some tariff. I was like, nope, zero tariff. I'm not taking it. It took them two weeks. They did everything. They got all their information, and they gave it. I had to pay demo rage and all of that. But I said, I'm not moving. <laughs> I'm not moving. This is what I'm, I'll make the calls. I have time. This is what I'm committed to do. And we had to do that. So what I saw with Agua, I do not want us to see with Continental to say, Washington has given Agua, but the front line right. execution of these policies, how do we educate them? How do we um, break down the barriers and training, right? Training, if this happens, this is what, so for me, that's really the fun side of my work. This platform is the public side, but I daily, it's about moving transactions along, and I could talk, let me keep quiet. Toyin, we, <laughs> I'm sorry, we have only 20 minutes to yes. end this, so um, I'm gonna jump directly to Jean Bertrand. Can Africa do better with trade? <laughs> I think that, that that's the that's the kind of question you should have posed to the commissioner. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, um, I, I think there, there are a couple, uh, uh, a number of facets. You know, um, number of answers to your question. Right. It, it's not as straightforward. Uh, uh, the first thing is, commissioner talked about. Uh, one of the key impediments to regional integration and trade in Africa, which is the political will. Right. And we've seen how that political will has been gaining momentum uh, on the continent. So there is a new uh, narrative, there is a new thinking, there is a new leadership, what uh, some will call entrepreneurship leadership in Africa. Mm -hmm. you know, and we, we see those leaders pushing the CFTA. It's very important because it signals a, a paradigm shift. You know, there was a time when uh, we were used to a number of countries moving uh, certain uh, regional initiatives in Africa, right? Uh, of course, those countries are still there. But we now see new countries, new leaders, you know, emerging, sometimes from nowhere, mm -hmm. you know, and pushing those kind of initiatives and getting results. So I, I think uh, it, it shows that trade can really become uh, an engine of economic growth in Africa. And even in those countries, you know, uh, your country is one of those. You know, uh, Niger is one of those. So you, you, you can see that th there is a shift. And I think as that shift continues, uh, we'll see more and more African leaders embracing trade as a way of, you know, uh, lifting up their people out of poverty. You also have uh, people in our generation, you know, who believe, when you look at uh, the number of African startup, for example, it keeps increasing. And this year we'll be having, uh, during the uh, African Industrialization Day, we are organizing with the uh, Korean Foundation a, 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 uh, a startup trade fair. 
and leading to you know what we'll be organizing uh, jointly with Afrik Zim Bank. Because we have that potential, the African uh, youth potential, which we, we need to capitalize on. And they are very innovative. Mm. They have ideas. Mm. And they are already doing it. You know, um, we had a conversation uh, during uh, one of the round of negotiations on payment systems in Africa. Right. And some officials, you know, with the public servant mentality, they were saying, oh, you need to consult with the national, the central banks. Mm -hmm. You need to consult with the Ministry of Finance. And one of the things I told them was, look, some of those things are already happening. Mm. And they are being made by, you know, people you wouldn't think of. People in their 20s coming up with payment solutions. It's, it's happening across the world. Right. So I think we have the potential, the human potential. Mm. And we have it at the right level, the youth. So I think trade will really happen in Africa this time around. Yes. Right. Uh, it, it's something we, we, we just need to be part of it. I think that's uh, the, 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 the challenge. Uh, will all of us be part of it? Or will some continue in mm. you know, the old uh, African uh, skepticism? Um, so to, to me, this is what is uh, very important to make sure that uh, all of us, all the stakeholders are aware of what is happening uh, in Africa and that those who are serious investors, they don't miss that chance because you know, it's, 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 it's actually yesterday that people were getting ready. It's not today. Today people are already you know, are, are trading uh, and it will just keep on uh, increasing. So to answer your question, yes, Africa is uh, trading. It's not uh, something that uh, we still have to do it. And we will do better with and it. And we will do better. Right. Yeah. Uh, Amara, this is something that uh, is very interesting to me personally because I have a background in software engineering. We have seen Africa service being leapfrogged, you know, with the dis uh, disruptions that is, that is happening at a rather very high rate, if you ask me, investments happening as well. But one of the things that has taken a very slow pace is the policies, regulatory policies, uh, changing to be able to accommodate these, you know, fast changes that are happening. From your uh, point of view or where you stand, what do you think needs to be done right now to ensure that the AFCFTA fusions, I mean, we're talking uh, digital payments, like he said. We're talking cryptocurrencies that are happening every day. We've had a conversation about bringing up a single African currency that is still in conversation. What needs to be done at this point in time with the regulatory systems in Africa, harmonizing them, but also coming up with something that is going to be accommodative to what we're seeing in this era? That's an excellent question. I think a lot of that work has already begun mm -hmm. um, through negotiations and that process of engaging each of the countries, even to bring them on board with the notion of a continental free trade area. From a policy standpoint, government is very slow. I don't think that that's a surprise <laughs> to, to anyone. It takes a very long time to get things done, uh, and then to get them done well is a whole other conversation. But with something as large as the free trade area, it has to have, we have to have an approach at the macro and the micro level. And again, the macro level is all of the countries that are party to the agreements. The micro level is within each country, how are they adjusting their regulatory requirements and their policies and protocols to be conformed and cohesive with the overall free trade area. It's a very intensive process. Um, what it requires is extensive capacity building. The first thing is actually education. So it was wonderful to have all of the heads of state uh, together in the same place, agreeing on moving this forward. Uh, from the top, you need that mandate so that at every other level of government, they can follow suit. Uh, leadership is, that's a requirement of leadership. Within each country, they have to be educated. Those who are the technocrats, those who are the operationalizers, the ones who will be actually drafting the documentation, they have to be appropriately educated. But we also have to have capacity building to make sure that they have the capacity to execute on what's being expected, mm -hmm. right? That's often a challenge that we see, especially when time is of the essence and we want to rush out there and do it, but you can't, 
at least I was always taught, do it well, do it with excellence rather than just trying to do it quickly. And so you have to do that capacity building. And so with the African Union and with the countries, it's making sure that you have uh, trainings, uh, individuals or entities that can offer that to the countries themselves because everyone has to be essentially singing from the same playbook. Um, that will ensure a more smooth uh, rollout of the free trade area, and it also avoids some of the obstacles that you, <clears throat> you might come across with. I, I mean, the United States, they didn't, have never heard of AGOA. Okay, well, <laughs> how does that happen, right? That tends to slow down the process, and if you are an investor or if you're in business, those kinds of delays can often inhibit and have a chilling effect on the willingness and the flow of trade mm. uh, amongst countries or between countries. So that's the biggest thing, I think, is the education and capacity building, and then making sure that everyone is on the same page about both the high points of regulatory requirements and the willingness to make necessary adjustments at the country level. This is probably one of the heaviest lifts because it, it requires us to step outside of just ourselves as countries and think about the whole. And as a continent, especially if things are moving toward a unified currency, for example, or even a free trade area that everyone is under the same umbrella, we cannot, no country can be the center of it. And a lot of that process played out. I mean, we saw as country after country began to sign on, but a lot of the delays were because there's, there are real concerns about how the free trade area will affect the local economy, the local government. And those are challenging processes, but they're necessary. And so you've got to have that commitment to working through those difficult conversations. The last piece that I'll add that's critical is making sure that the technology is aligned with the regulatory requirements and the free trade area. So what was one of the most exciting things at when we were in Niamey was the, the launch of the, of the pay system that addresses this issue of different currencies. Who wants to go through transacting in their mind as they're trying to you know, work a trade deal? No one wants to go through that headache. So to already have developed a mechanism uh, through the bank to actually deal with the different currencies, it takes a huge weight off of a business person, an investor, someone who's already engaged in trade. That is when technology works seamlessly with government to address an issue. And it is absolutely what our focus should be. The continent is, is notorious in a good way for being innovative out of necessity, whether it's using our cell phones to transact with the bank or uh, how we communicate with each other or innovative ways of keeping energy beyond generators. Uh, for, <laughs> for those of us who uh, have grown up in environments where we need generators to keep energy, to keep lights on. But we're very innovative. The key is scaling it at the continental level. So taking some of these innovations, marrying them with the policies and the regulations that are being put in force uh, by the continent as a whole and the countries, and then making sure that we're evolving our technology needs, even as our regulatory requirements are being adjusted and are evolving. That's another key that is very promising because of the interest and the energy and new technologies that are on the horizon, but it's absolutely necessary to make sure that we have a smoother transition and a smoother rollout. Thank you, Amara. She mentioned something very key to uh, the trade in Africa, of course, skills it being a, a very big impediment. But I want to come to you, Toyn, and of course, this our platform, your platform, everyone's platform. We should use this opportunity to pitch to investors and businessmen why they should trade with Africa. What are some of, because we've seen the challenges, you know, but why should I trade with Africa instead of, say, China or NAFTA or the European Union? Why Africa? Um, so, so for me, I usually take this approach of... I think the microphone level is down. Can someone bring that up, please? Yes, yeah, so, so for me, um, I usually take the approach of it's not either or, it's both. Africa needs things like AGOA to function and the continental tree, free trade to function. Mm. So one of the questions I have is, how do we keep both afloat? That we don't put all, pull all our resources out of one into another, right? Because from an investor standpoint, um, there in, Agua would drive a, a certain type of investment that might look different than the Continental Free Trade Agreement, right? So Agua would drive, push like productivity on ground out. So everything in my business mind is all about export strategy 
and market access. Agoa provides market access into the U.S. According to the World Bank, U.S. controls 40% of global wealth, even though it's 4% of the world. Global wealth is here. So what is our strategy to capture investors' mind here? 40% of wealth is in the U.S. So for me, Agoa could be a vehicle of still starting some type of you know, investment discussion. And then the Continental Free Trade Agreement is that of productivity produced on the continent. Not just as an end game, but as a solution to um, you know, providing your goods and services in a seamless way across the world's largest trade block. That sells itself. I think what we now need to do is take that message into the boardrooms. So I often get invited into um, corporations because the I, so I used to provide strategy, three-year strategy, five-year roadmaps for executives. I know the way they think. Short attention span, bullet points, in and out, done. They don't do this. The people who need this type of forum are the um, decision makers. So when I say decision maker, there are different levels of decision. But do you know that the person that is actually writing a check to China and buying from China is not the CEO? They are middle managers. So what we've missed is we're not carrying the middle managers along. So we formed this forum. This forum, if you observe, is designed for the middle managers, but with the speakers giving them everything they need. Because building my business career, they used to send me to forums like this. Go learn about technology. Go and learn about blockchain, right? Corporate used to do that. We've designed this to be the go-to place if corporate America wants to learn what's in, what's, what's the latest thing in Africa. That's where we're taking this to. So for me, um, I say let's look at our resources. Resources are scarce. Let's see. It's, it's all about export. Continental Free Trade Agreement is an open market. If, if I'm in Nigeria, it means I can now go beyond my borders. So it becomes very important for each of the governments to say, what's my export strategy? Be, be it to the next door neighbor or be it outside of the continent. Those who get their export strategy right and fully finance exports would win. They are the winners of this game. And that's one of the reasons we have banking here, because we, we can talk. We can say buy, sell, buy, sell. But when it comes to transacting, you want to export, you want to produce, um, you need that. Finally, I want to also explain the way the global market works. Nobody has the money anywhere. What the global market does is they pursue um, capturing demand. Businesses pursue capturing demand. China goes after demand. When they capture the demand, and the demand is usually futuristic, so we're in 2019, they've already captured 2020 buying demand. Right now, it's done. Apparel, for example, has a nine-month cycle. They lock it down because that nine-month cycle is used to produce two million pieces. So meaning by 2020, I want you to produce me two million pieces of X. That demand is locked down. They now take the demand to a bank like AfriExim Bank to finance that. Right? So all of that structure for me is, is what I'm looking at in the private space to say we can talk, but what are the engines of growth for a business to transact, to export beyond their borders. This is an enabler. And Agua continent, I kind of look at them as opening a market of opportunity. But if people do not organize the market, so there's capacity challenges, but the market has to be organized. Finally, what I would also say, people say capacity is the problem of Africa. I say it's organization. The market is not organized. Here's why. For Walmart, the plastic bag, that we all shop with, there is no single supplier in the world that can meet the demand for that. So that buying is divided about among suppliers. Africa needs to get to a place where we are aggregating that when, when a demand is pushed to, let's say, African Union, we want to buy X, Y, Z. You may not be able to find one manufacturer that can meet that demand, but can we find 500? Because that's what Westro Coffee does. They have gone in and aggregated over 50,000 mom and pop 
coffee producers in East Africa. 50,000. Right? And what do they do? Aggregate, process, package, and that's now ending up in Starbucks, Sam's Club. So we need businesses to step in and help aggregate and organize the market to really actualize. Because every time we look at the market, we're like, you cannot meet my demand, so I'm not going to work with you. So that's something on the practical side that I want to see as well. Right, Toin brings us just uh, two minutes to the, sh to the top of the hour. And that pretty much means we are wrapping up because we want to be uh, right on time. But if you have anything you would like to add on what she just said, you have a minute between the two of you. I skip, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yes, let me start. A couple of things. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, uh, capacity building, sensitization. Uh, just want to, um, you know, to share the information uh, that uh, on some of the things we're doing, you know, to address those issues. Uh, we are currently um, uh, finalizing a post-launch implementation plan, uh, which includes, among others, you know, uh, capacity building activities, uh, targeting uh, uh, government officials, the private sector, because sometimes also the private sector is not aware of the rules of origin under these various agreements. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also looking at sensitizing, you know, the various communities, you know, so that people are aware of uh, what is in the agreement, what are the institutions that are in place, what are the recourse mechanisms that, they, that are available in case they come across uh, uh, non-tariff barriers. So uh, that's one thing. Um, th there was something uh, Toyin spoke about, you know, how do you ensure alignment between the AFCFTA and existing agreements, whether you know, those are regional agreements or agreements concluded between African countries and, and, and third parties. It's, it is a very important issue that we need to, uh, uh, to address at some point down the road. In the short term, yes, there would be a need to uh, let the countries you know, continue trading under the various schemes. But going forward, there would be a need to really rationalize and ensure that Africa as one trading bloc has only one agreement <laughs> with third countries. Mm. Because it, it, on, until you get there, the issue of fragmentation will continue. Yes. So we, we need to make sure that uh, uh, we have coherent policies, trade policies, vis-a-vis uh, -vis third, uh, uh, third parties. Um, w one of the issues I see when it comes to uh, implementing the uh, uh, AFCFTA, it is the capacity of the business community to take advantage uh, of, of the opportunities, especially the private sector uh, on the continent. Mm. Because what we currently seeing, we're seeing a new trend where uh, investors from um, other part of the world are already getting ready. They're already on the ground waiting for uh, uh, June, uh, uh, July 2020 to take advantage of those opportunities. So do we have... Uh, wh where are the African uh, private uh, uh, sector or business uh, businesses? Where are they? What kind of strategies are they putting in place? Um, how do they scale up their activities? Are they looking at uh, joint ventures? So instead of waiting for uh, uh, businesses from other part of the world to come to Africa, they should actually go to them, mm. you know, create those linkages so as to bring them uh, uh, in, in, in the continent and be able to, to get ready because uh, this is the only way they will be able to uh, to take advantage of the uh, the opportunities. If not, what will be uh, uh, what we will see, you know, in the near future would be a new kind of uh, scramble of Africa, and <laughs> it's already happening. So, to me, the issue is not whether uh, one is part of, at least in the short term, whether one is part of the Afro champion, whether one is a big uh, private sector, because what is big private sector in <laughs> big business in Africa compared to, you know. Uh, uh, the mega companies that we, we know. So I think what is important is for African companies to be ready to put in place the right type of strategies, you know, so as to attract, uh, 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 go into joint ventures, attract partners. They can then, you know, take advantage of the market. 
And in doing this, there are a number of uh, considerations that uh, they have to be aware of. One is because of the, uh, the middle class in Africa, uh, the demand is there and there will be demand for high quality goods. Yes. So uh, Africa shouldn't be you know, a dumping ground for you know, a, a certain type of product. That will not work. You know? uh, the second thing is uh, because we have that growing middle class, there is also awareness of what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. So companies that will really go towards sustainability mm -hmm. are very likely to, you know, to capture the market. And the final point is act quickly. <laughs> right. First mover advantage, because yes. as I said, companies are positioning themselves and late comers will always have hard time penetrating the market. It doesn't matter whether you are an African company, when loyalty is created, uh, the com those companies, they will sustain it. So for me, this is an opportunity to say to uh, the business, the African business community, uh, which is here, to, to really come up with the right type of strategies to get partners here, invest in Africa. Africa is the continent of the future. 600 million uh, uh, people in the middle class by 2030, that's what you need to think of. And looking at a 3.4 trillion GDP, aggregated GDP, that's what is out there. And this is why companies are likely to move towards Africa instead of other parts of the world. I thank you. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, jean bertrand I think we're out of time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if Amaro has something to add, because I, I can give her a minute. <laughs> yes, I can, I, I, can be, I can be very lenient. I can give you a minute if you want to add something. Uh, not really. I mean, I actually just wanted to underscore everything that was just said. Right. I think it's really important on the ground, being prepared for what the rollout is going to be, because you can create something, but if the preparation hasn't been done uh, beforehand, you won't, the target market, target audience won't be able to take advantage of what's been created. So I just wanted to uh, short and sweet underscore what has already been said. All right. Uh, uh, maybe three things that I would add from my personal understanding, and I hope that you learned the same. Be quick to act because the market is ready for you. Be informed, and there's something else you added just about now. I'll be prepared, be quick, be informed. Right. That it is. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. This conversation does not end here. It goes on on Twitter, even in the hall where we're going to dine. Please be sure to connect, have you know, a networking session of your own with someone that you need to do business with or learn from. The Twitter hashtag is tread with Africa, hashtag tread with Africa. Let's put the word out there. Let Africa know, let the world know that we mean business. Our time is now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.